So this episode, I want to cover the initial design of my DIY digital piano. And this covers both the first concert plan and all the changes that needed to be made in order to get this first prototype printed and operational. So in a way, it's more along the lines of uh, 10 or so iterations in a trench coat. And it's basically the CAD representation of the eight key prototype that I showed off near the end of the last episode. As you can see, at this point, I was completely focused on the actual action with little consideration towards the electronics and uh, covers, mainly just deciding that I want to have some way of uh, seeing the hammer action from the outside, hence this little um, window at the top here. And the functional limitations of my uh, Prusa MK3 uh, printer, meaning that all the parts were limited to 250 by 210 by 210 millimeters, hence why this part, for example, needed to be split in two. And the plan was to break down the full 88 keyboard into 11 identical 8 key sections you see here that would attach together with one meter long rods passing through them, through the points here, here here, here, and uh, here. Each section would also be individually assembled so as to be structurally sound in order to make assembly and disassembly easy. Uh, quite important seeing how regulating the action would have to be done by splitting the piano back into the 11 eight key sections and working on them individually. The back plate here was left as a blank canvas for later. It would be where I would add the electronics for key sensing, but at this point in the design, I wasn't even sure how exactly I would sense the key presses, let alone how I would communicate them to the MIDI output. Well, uh, let's take a look at the actual mechanics. Looking at it from the side and removing the framework so we can see the actual uh, moving components, we can subdivide them into three groups. You have the actual key itself right here. You have the key lever mechanism right uh, here. And finally, you have the actual um, key hammer action, the Hickman action right over here. Each one serves its own purpose. The keys are, well, move up and down on these uh, rails that pass through here, here, and uh, here, the player actually presses on them. This causes the key lev lever mechanism right here to react and uh, rotate around the uh, center pivots here, here, and here. And the ro actual rotation itself is then transferred over into the Hickman action here, which causes the hammer to actually move and uh, provides the feeling of the action. A given key is pretty simple. You have your odd and even variants, and due to the decision to stick with the coloring scheme of a traditional piano, be it classical or Yanko, uh, there would be even and odd keys in both black and white. Even keys, such as the one here, have buttons on their second, fourth, and sixth rows, along with the narrow button along the back, whereas, uh, odd keys, such as the one right here, have buttons on their first, third, and fifth rows along with that same narrow button. Since the rows alternate like so, uh, the width of a given button can be twice as uh, large as the width of the action, making the buttons uh, center to center be 21.6 millimeters and um, totaling up to 130 millimeter octave span or 5.1 inches, which is 22% shorter than a regular piano's 6.5 inches and provides one of the strengths of a Yanko piano in that theoretically it offers an easier time for players with smaller hands or conversely allows for a player to play uh, longer intervals such as those needed for any Rachmaninoff piece. The bottoms themselves are arranged in a staircase pattern, as you can see here, in order to allow for a player to press down on any of the buttons without hitting the button at the front um, for a full 10 millimeters of movement. Uh, let me actually show you it right here. So I can move this button down. And if we mark it, it started from here and went down to here, a full 10 millimeters of movement. And at no point did it collide with the front button here. So if you're pressing down on the button, you don't have to worry about hitting the button at the front. Additionally, I uh, tiled 
the uh, buttons or slope them downwards right here by around five degrees towards the back, which uh, kind of uh, moved the staircase uh, downwards and decreased the verticality a tiny bit, which should help with uh, holding a more natural wrist position while playing. If we now show the framework and hide the keys, you can see the guide pins upon which the keys glide, ensuring that they can move up and down smoothly while preventing any side-to-side -side sway. You have eight at the front here and then 16 along the back with eight at the top and eight at the bottom. Each of these uh, pins has an oval cross section, which allows you to rotate them slightly in order to adjust the cross-sectional uh, distance along the length, uh, which allows you to um, ensure that the key sits snugly so as not to move side to side, but loose enough to minimize friction. Uh, moving on to the key lever mechanism right here. And we first have to look at the original Yanko piano uh, design. One of the key features of the Yanko layout was this parallelogram design right here. It was specifically done to allow the key to move vertically while preventing any rotation, essentially making it such that no matter which button you press down on, uh, it would still move the same 10 millimeters of uh, distance, which is something you can't say on a regular piano. Uh, since the regular piano design is more or less a giant lever with a button at the front. And then if you pressed it at the front, the key would uh, tilt along the side like so, uh, moving 10 millimeters. But if you pressed it along the back, that same uh, movement would require only maybe 5 to 2 millimeters which means that uh, to play the same note at the same volume, you'd need to press two to five times harder on a um, regular piano, whereas on a Yanko piano, you would need exactly the same amount of force. When I started doing the planning for my own DIY piano, naturally I started with this, but uh, quickly realized that this uh, contraption here probably would need to be changed considering that all of this space is effectively dead space that increases the depth of the piano while not really providing anything of use. Like you can't put any electronics or anything else in here. So effectively this just makes the uh, piano be 100 to 150 millimeters longer than it needs to be. After some brainstorming, I decided on this design of two coupled rotors. The key would be screwed to the parts here and uh, here, such that when I press the key, the rotors would rotate synchronously due to this lower rod connecting them here. This offered three benefits. One, I no longer needed the 100 to 150 millimeters of dead space between the keys and the hammer action. In fact, they could be positioned as very closely together with just a tiny space for the framework that would hold everything together. Uh, number two, I could connect the hammer action directly to the middle rotor along here and not require an extra rod in order to do so. And uh, this does cause a bit of an issue because I needed to add this third rotor in order to hold the back check, but that's an acceptable compromise. And finally, number three, I already had available the uh, slots in the actual rotors themselves, so as to counterbalance the weight of the keys. Finally, we come to the Hickman action. As you can see, once I remove all the other parts, it is deceptively simple. Unlike the grand piano action, which is quite complicated, especially within the whipping assembly, in here we only have uh, basically five moving parts. You have the upper and uh, lower jacks here, the driving lever right here, and the hammer lever right here. The fifth part is attached directly to the back rotor and is the uh, back check that I talked about previously. There's also the flange right here, which is attached directly to the framework. And it is important to have it as a separate part instead of uh, fused to the uh, framework in order to allow for precise alignment of the hammer, both uh, vertically and horizontally. 
Now let's go over the action step by step. In its rest position, the hammer hovers just a bit over the hammer rest rail, ready to move upwards the moment the player starts pressing on the key. The upper and lower jacks are coupled together at a 185 uh, degree angle so as to be firmly uh, transfer the force of the key press from the key to the hammer. And the front of the middle rotor rests on the back check felt. As the player starts pressing down on the key, the jack raises up until the let off mechanism triggers right here and begins decoupling the top and bottom jacks like so. Almost at the same time, the driving lever reaches its maximum rotation due to the limiter right here, which places the um, hammer around five millimeters or so away from the strings, or in this case, the hammer hit felt. The hammer is then free to fly this remaining distance, rotating around this point, and presumably triggering the note and measuring the speed at which the hammer was traveling through the electronics placed somewhere here. At this point, the key is completely pressed. It is resting on the back felt here and the front felt here. And due to the uh, unalignment of the top and bottom jacks, it is no longer connected to the hammer action. What this means is that the hammer is free to fly up, hit the uh, hammer head felt here and uh, bounce backwards, causing the uh, driving lever here to counter rotate and up until the point where the hammer is caught by the back check, which ends us in this particular position, which uh, remains so up until the player lets go of the key. When the key is released, the back check releases the hammer, which due to the repetition string uh, right here, doesn't Im immediately fall back down and instead briefly hovers uh, while the middle rotor rotates and allows the upper and uh, lower jacks to snap back together, coupling the key movement to the hammer movement once more and uh, allowing the key to be pressed again for the next hit. Uh, note that this realignment happens before the key is even a quarter of the way back to its resting position, which is what allows the key to be played again 10 to 15 times per second. And in fact, we can just simulate the key dropping down to its resting position like so. All right, now let's take a look at the actual prototype. We have our eight keys right here. We have the key lever action at the bottom here, and we have the Hickman hammer action at the back here. The counterweights for the keys are in the slots at the front rotor here and the back rotor here, and are actually key car wheel balance weights, which turned out to be just the right size for this project. The keys themselves uh, glide along the uh, key pins right here, here and in the front here, which means that each key moves very easily up and down, but prevents any side-to-side uh, -side, uh, movement, or at least minimizes it. Each of these red circles is a felt bushing that does a similar job to a ball bearing. And yes, I had to add them in personally myself, glue them in. There are in fact gonna be over 1300 of these uh, center pins in the full 88 key piano. So I have my work uh, cut out for me. Let's do a quick demo of the entire action in real life. So when the key is pressed, it moves down, forcing the hammer to go up. At a certain point, as you can see, the let off mechanism uh, activates, disconnecting the movement of the key from the movement of the hammer. This happens right at the very peak of the hammer's movement. So there's only five millimeters left of uh, distance between the hammer and the hammer head felt. The hammer flies up those five millimeters, hits the hammer head felt, uh, probably triggers the sensor here, which is currently non-existent, uh, before rebouncing, uh, moving downwards and getting caught by the back check. At this point, this is completely disconnected, but the moment I let go of the key, this will reconnect due to this uh, repetition spring, which forces it uh, back inwards, so just like so. At which point the key is then free to rise back up and uh, the entire action resets. 
Uh, in terms of our regulation, I've added a, uh, well, screw right here, which can be used to regulate the height of the hammer in its rest position. As you can see, it require it needs to be just a tiny bit uh, above the hammer rest felt right here. The second point of regulation is actually the flange right here, which can be turned side to side to make sure that the keys are evenly aligned with, uh, you know, their strings essentially. And you can add a bit of uh, tape to the bottom on one side or the other to tilt the hammer to make sure that it moves in a perfectly vertical alignment. Like, so as you can see, there's very little side to side movement as it goes up and down. Uh, finally, the repetition spring right here can be adjusted to be, well, tighter or looser, either just by move, bending the spring like so, or by repositioning it to one of these three holes along here, which is necessary because the hammer weights are actually graded, which means that they go from around 4-5 uh, grams on the lightest side to around 15 grams on the heaviest. Um, if we look at the way the uh, Hickman action was designed originally, uh, there was actually two more uh, regulation screws located here and here. The first of which uh, basically controlled when the let off began. And I consider that as not too important because, um, well, this isn't an acoustic piano, so it's not. it doesn't have to be as precisely regulated. But at the same time, all the pieces have been carefully designed in CAD software. So considering that all of this is getting 3D printed to pretty high tolerances, I can assume that if I have a design that works, I don't need to modify it quite as much as you would if it was handmade in wood. Uh, the second part is right along here, which controls how high the hammer rises before it essentially has to fly the rest of the distance. So. Uh, basically controls this five millimeter gap that you want. And uh, if it's too low, that's not good. Even if it's too high, that's also not good. I've also decided that as before, since all of this is being made in CAD and printed to high tolerances, I don't need uh, this particular adjustment. A uh, bit of foreshadowing there. Anyway, as you can see, the action worked acceptably well. And I was satisfied with the prototype enough to start fully testing it, which is when I came across several problems, which uh, nearly cost me to scrap the project. Or after a night's rest, open up Fusion 360 and uh, start almost from scratch. But more on that in the next video.